Good morning. I'm really glad that you joined us today. Whether you're a member of Newport Christian, whether you attend off and on, or you visited once or twice, or, or maybe this is the first time you've ever joined us, whether in person or online, I'm so glad you're here today. We have a really special service lined up with some awesome things. I know that the tendency is, is to just sit there, maybe sit back on your couch, and relax, get, get distracted by the kids or the dog, or pull out your cell phone and start searching on Facebook or playing a game. But I, I ask that you really put that stuff aside as much as you possibly can today. To listen, to learn, uh, when we sing, to, to worship God. If, if you're able to and, and you can, stand and worship, sing with us. And make this not a, a movie to watch or a TV show to enjoy, but, but rather a service to be involved in. Let's open today with prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for, for bringing us here. Thank you for um, just helping us join together, even from a distance. And, and Lord, help today to be a, a blessing and an honor for you and for us. Lord, help it to be a time where we can grow in our relationship with you. In your name I pray, amen. seems like, if you're like me, <laughs> it kind of seems like we're all waiting right now. We're all, we're all waiting around, kind of wanting to get back to normal, right? We're all in strange situations at this moment. And, and in fact, you look at the, at the worship center here, and, and it's Sunday morning, and you're watching this video, you're listening to a sermon, and yet and you're, you're not in this room. You're not here together with other believers, uh, worshiping and le learning and, and communing. And, and things are different, and we're all kind of going, I, I just want things to get back to normal. Or, or a phrase that maybe we say a little bit uh, is the new normal. And we say that because we understand that, that things are going to be different. Things are, are not going to ever be completely back the way that they used to be. And, and some of that will be forced on us, right? There, there, there will be some of that. There's going to always be more plexiglass around. And, and we may be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about uh, germs and things like that. We, we may have more people working from home uh, than, than ever before because businesses understand some of the different financial implications of, of renting a building versus having people work at home and Productivity. So, so things are going to be different, but there's also some things that I think 
can come about, some, some permanent changes that can come about by choice. And, and if we're wise, then I think what we need to do is really pause and think about what, what do we want to be different permanently because of 2020, the uh, year of apocalypse that it seems like this is. And, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Reed, we're, we're still in the middle of this. It's August. We're, we're still uh, self-isolating. We still have uh, social justice issues going on. We, we're still dealing with different things, seeds in the mail and murder hornets and all of these crazy 2020 things. We're, we're not past it yet, Reed. But, but I think that's in some ways a good thing. Because what happens is when you're in the middle of a situation is oftentimes the hardest to really pause and kind of reflect on what's going and, and figuring out what you can learn from it. But I also think that it's probably the best time. I mean, think about it this way. If, have you ever lost a kid? I've, I've lost a kid once or twice before. And you start searching around frantically for that child. And in the moment, you send up a quick panicked prayer to the Lord. Father, help me. Help me find this child. And in that moment, you're, you're willing to promise anything, do anything, say anything, whatever it takes, if you can just find that child. Maybe you've, you've been standing there as a, a loved one has been rushed off to the hospital in an ambulance. And you've had that same feeling of, of, of panic and, and stress and tension and, and throwing up that prayer, God, God, whatever I have to do, whatever it takes, I will do it. I'll change anything. Maybe, maybe you've been in a situation that you know you shouldn't have been in. And you were caught or you were almost caught or you felt like you were going to be caught. And you say that same prayer, Lord, just help me. Whatever it takes, just get me out of this mess. And maybe it's something else, another situation that you've been in. But we've all been in those situations in our life. And here's what happens is you're in that situation and you're, you're panicked, you're stressed, you're worried. You reach out to the Lord. You're willing to do whatever. And then as soon as that situation is over and as soon as the tension is gone, all of the sudden, all of those promises, all of that willingness to do anything starts to dissipate. And you may try to be good and you may try to be better and you may try to change what you know you should have changed for a month or a year. But eventually you will slip back into that same habit. Maybe you won't even last that long. Maybe, maybe it will only be a, a couple hours and you'll slip right back to where you were. And that's what happens if we're not intentional. If we don't stop and really think about what's going on right now and what we can learn about it, that I think we're going to be in such a hurry to get back to normal that we'll, that we'll miss a good opportunity to really learn and grow and better ourselves. And so that's what I, what I kind of want to do this sermon series is look at some different ways that we can really grow because of this and not get things back to normal, not even get things back to the new normal, but maybe make things not normal. Maybe we can make things better than normal. And the first real step in that is, is to actually look back at what normal was and maybe realize that that normal still had its flaws. It's easy to look back and, and we gloss over the, the bad things, don't we? The good old days, that's why they're called the good old days. We, we look back and we, we think positively. We, we brush past any, any bad things. But, but the truth of the matter was that we had things wrong in our lives before 2020, before the coronavirus, before rioting and, and social justice uprising, and before all of these other 2020 issues came up, we all ha still had problems in life. Maybe you had financial stress. Maybe you didn't have enough finances. Maybe, 
You had been poor in your use of the finances that you had and you were in debt to your eyeballs and you were only succeeding because you were getting that paycheck every month in order to make all of those payments and keep the the debt down uh, just under that bursting limit. Maybe you were having relationship problems before all this with a a spouse or with a child or someone else and and, and the only being able to get away for work or being able to have times outside of the house apart from each other is what kind of kept things below the boiling point. Maybe, Maybe you had health problems. Whatever it is, all of these things, we all had problems in life. We all had issues and trouble in life. Even before this year, this isn't a new thing having trouble. It may be bigger and more widespread, but it's not a new thing. And so when we look back and we see those issues, here's the thing that I think 2020 has done is I think that it's, I think that it's caused us to confront some of those issues a little bit more head on. Because if you had financial problems, you might really have seen that come to a head this year. Maybe you lost your job. And now that that financial crisis that you had barely been avoiding, now all of a sudden you had to face and figure out, what do I need to change? How do I need to do things differently in order to just get through? And maybe that's something we can learn. Maybe the relationship problems that you've been having, now all of a sudden you were cooped up in the same house with that person for a lot more time and you... You had to really confront that issue and and go, how are we going to get along through this? And my guess is that one of two things happened, no matter what your problem was, no matter what the situation, most likely you had to in some ways confront it in 2020. And most likely there were one of two outcomes. Most likely, number one, is you really were able to work on it. And you were really able to, to... better yourself and and maybe grow even closer to the Lord in your faith through it. My, this relationship grew and it was amazing. I was always a a nervous, stressed out person, but, but through this, I have really leaned on God and he's been able to get me through a tense time without me succumbing to a lot of the things that I normally succumb to. Or the other thing that's happened is that you've been confronted by this stuff and, and it's actually made things worse. That relationship being so close has only caused more of the grinding and the pounding and the difficulty. Your financial problems have exploded and now you don't know what to do and where to turn. You're struggling, you're worried, you're going to lose everything. Your nervousness, your anxiety is is past the boiling point and, and you've spent all year just in fear and worried and stressed out and troubled and not sleeping and anxious. And it's caused you to somewhat pull away from the Lord. That's my guess is that This year has kind of done one of those two things with your difficult, stressful situation. And so we we can handle this in different ways. And what happens is that we all are people who are creatures of habit. And we tend to make the same choices in the same situations over and over and over again. The reason your finances are the way they were because of the decisions that you continued to make. The reason that your relationship was where it was because of the decisions that you continued to make. The reason that your stress level or whatever the problem is, there's so many issues and problems. The reason it was where it was is because of decisions that you had made. The ways that you had responded in certain situations. And what happens is, is I really think that one thing that we can learn this year is to value a measured response. I think it is worth pausing and actually thinking about how we want to respond to a situation. Because it's, oh, it's so easy and natural to just do a knee-jerk reaction. To always act the same way in the same situations. Even if the situation fluctuates a little bit. If it's the same sort of stressful, difficult situation, we tend to turn back to our same responses and ways to react. And yet, and yet a measured response can change so much dramatically in your life. And in fact, we think about the, a lot of times the, the response that's the most natural is the one that's going to get you in the most trouble. 
And it's an unnatural response, pausing and processing and making an unnatural response that can actually lead you in a better direction. In fact, I mean, think about this. We serve a Savior. (laughs) We serve a Savior who chose to leave heaven, to come down on this earth as a man, to walk this earth, and to ultimately die a horrible, painful criminal's death. And he did all that, which was not natural. That was an unnatural response. And yet look at the way that we have been blessed and enriched because of that. And if we're not careful, what's going to happen is we're going to, we're going to do things differently in 2020. And then as soon, whenever we get out, whether it's the end of this year, whether it's earlier than that, whether it's later than that, we're going to get out of the end of a lot of this crisis and we're going to go back to where we were before. It's human nature if we don't stop now and think through. In fact, one of my favorite uh, weird verses in the Bible (laughs) is in the book of Proverbs. And I love this one. The good old Proverbs. There's such great uh, wisdom in here from Solomon. Proverbs 26, uh, verse 11 says, As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. I love that. It's such a vivid mental picture of a dog, and they do that. In fact, the other day, I, was, I got home from work, and I went in, and, and my wife wanted me to grill something. So I went out on the front porch to get the grill ready. And as I stepped out on the front porch, I looked down, and there was a pile of, of cat vomit right on my welcome mat at my house. One of my cats had, had thrown up right there. And yet, even as I was standing there, as I called Audrey, I said, hey, the, one of the cats threw up. And even in that short amount of time as I'm standing right there, one of the cats had already come back. In fact, both of them, at one point or another during this time, came back and, and was sniffing around at its, at its own vomit, returning to this nasty, disgusting, vile mess. And we do that so often. We get ourselves in a bad situation. And no sooner do we start to go the other direction than we get pulled back and we return right to that horrible mess. And that's not what I want to do. I want to be not normal this year. I want to return to better than normal, not back to just normal. And what I want to do today is I want to look at a guy in the Old Testament who who made some measured responses in his life, who who made good choices over and over. In fact, he did it over a time period, not just for a short time period, but for about a 30-year time period. And I want to look at how that led him in his life. And this is... This is big, and, and, and this is a story that pretty much all of us are going to be familiar with. And when I tell you who it is, you're going to go, ah, and you're going to want to jump. Mentally, you're going to want to jump to the end of the story, because that's what we do. And we know these stories. This is a common story, and you're going to jump to the end mentally, and you're going to see how it works out. And I want you to try to fight that. It's so easy, but I want you to try to fight that, because I think it'll really be for your benefit if you can stay with me through this story and see how this young man responded over and over and over again and how it changed the outcome of this story because he simply took a measured response. So the story begins is about 2000 BC and that's when Abraham was called. And Abraham was told by God that you were going to uh, be the father of many nations. So Abraham ended up having a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And Jacob had these 12 sons, which would eventually be the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of these sons was a young man named Joseph. And now Joseph was a guy who, who was the youngest. He was also the favorite. He was from his, Jacob's favorite wife, which is a whole other story. But he was the favorite son. And so Jacob uh, doted on this boy, gave him a special robe, gave him all sorts of gifts, took care of him. And it made the other brothers jealous. And it drove them to jealousy so bad that they finally decided they were going to kill Joseph. And so Joseph one day gets sent by his father to go check on his brothers. That's a real good way to handle a situation where there's jealousy. 
And so as Joseph is going to check on his brothers, his brothers see him. They're watching the sheep. They've been, they know he's probably coming to see what's going on. He's going to go back and snitch to their dad about all their mistakes. And so they get angry and they decide to kill Joseph. And they decide to, to kill him. And in fact, they throw him in a well and they're going to kill him. And Reuben, one of the brothers, speaks up and he says, hey, maybe we shouldn't kill him. Maybe we should throw him in this pit for a while. And Reuben was actually going to save Joseph. But at some point while Joseph, or while Reuben was away, the other brothers decided, hey, it's no good to us if Joseph is dead. What if we, what if we have some gain out of this? What if, what if we can figure out a way to profit through this situation? And so here's where that story begins. When they see Joseph, now Genesis 37, verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. And so here's Joseph. He gets taken by his brothers. He gets thrown in the well. He gets sold into slavery. What a, what a way to have your life change just like that. And he gets sold. He gets taken away. And he actually gets sold into Egypt into a guy named Potiphar's house. And Potiphar buys him, a wealthy man. And Joseph is at Potiphar's house. And here's what it says. Uh, actually, in Genesis 39, uh, verse 2, the first half, verse 2, it says, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Now think about this. Number one, slavery, being rich and free and then being sold into slavery was like the worst thing that could happen to you in life in those days. That was worse than anything else. That was worse than losing a fortune. That was worse than anything you could imagine to have happen in your life. And that's what happened to Joseph. And it says that the Lord was with him. And I don't know about you, but it may have felt hard for Joseph to feel that way, like the Lord was with him. Uh, he'd just been sold into slavery. Nobody is looking for him. Nobody cares about him. And maybe, maybe in fact, that's where you are today. You feel kind of all alone, like nobody cares about you, like nobody's looking for you like nobody's with you. And yet Joseph, it says here, had God with him. And this is hard for a lot of our theologies because, because a lot of the times in Christianity, and maybe you're a Christian right now and you're Stephen struggling with this because of 2020 and what's going on. Maybe you've struggled with this in the past. Maybe you're somebody who really isn't a Christian and you just stumbled across this video and you're watching it to see what I'm talking about. But but it's our theology so often is this. If God is with you, things will work out for you. That's what we think as Christians. And the problem is that that's not the way Christians have thought throughout history. That's not the way we see in the Bible or in Christians throughout history. We don't see that working that way. And yet that's what we think. That's what we want. And when we look at this situation with Joseph. We go, here's a young man. And it says God was with him, and yet his life has just taken a massive tumble down the rabbit hole. And so here's Joseph. Now he's sold into slavery. And it says God is with him, and it says God prospered him. Well, here, here's a look at what it says. 39, again, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And here's how he prospered. Uh, verse 3, when, the master, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. And so here's Joseph... And Joseph is now moved into second place in this man's household, in Potiphar's house, and he's, and he's doing everything. And it says God blessed Joseph, but how did he bless him? By making things good for his master. 
It doesn't say that he made life good for Joseph. It says he made things good for Potiphar because of Joseph. And so here is Joseph, and he's, he's working, and he's striving, and he's struggling. And he's, he's working, and things are going well in this house, and, and it seems like he's pulled himself maybe out of this mess. But again, don't jump ahead yet. Joseph, in the next few verses here, it says, was a, was a handsome young man. And Potiphar's wife noticed. And she starts trying to woo Joseph. And she starts trying to pull Joseph to her to do inappropriate things behind his master's back. And he starts fighting her off. It would have been easy. This was his master's wife. This wasn't a request. This was a command. And yet Joseph's response, if you read his response, it says, how could I sin against the Lord? Wait a second, sin against the Lord? This is the same Lord who lets you get sold into slavery? This is the same Lord who's, who's blessing your master because of you rather than blessing you. And yet Joseph still refused to sin. And he refused, and, and Potiphar's wife was very persistent over and over and over again. She persisted until finally Joseph was resisted so often that she gets offended. And she lies to Potiphar, and she gets Joseph thrown in to prison. Potiphar throws him into prison for the very sin that he was unwilling to commit. He got arrested and imprisoned, hear that, for the very sin that he was unwilling to commit. He was in an unwinnable situation. He made a choice. It was the best choice he could make, and he still got punished for it. And then we see in this passage that, that he begins working at the prison. And the prison uh, guard uh, gets to see how well Joseph is working. And Joseph gets built up in the prison and he starts doing more and more in the prison and once again we see Joseph <laughs> we see Joseph being blessed by blessing the one whose care he is under the, the warden ended up getting the blessing the prison was blessed not Joseph and so here's Joseph and, and again he's been taken from bad to worse and he's here in this situation and it would be so easy, I don't know about you, but the choices that I would be making would likely be very different. Well, Joseph had been in prison for a while. Again, we've got to remember, this is taking time. This is over the course of many years. From the time he was sold into slavery until this time, he was probably, it was probably about a 10 year period that all of this has happened. And Joseph is in prison, and then he gets two men thrown in prison with him that he's under, or, or, taking care of. And they're Pharaoh's attendants, his, his uh, cupbearer and his baker. And these two attendants are thrown into jail. Pharaoh got upset with them. We don't know why, but they got thrown into jail. And Joseph starts taking care of them. And after a time, again, it doesn't say how much time, after a time, they have dreams. And, they, and Joseph comes in one day, he's taking care of him, he comes in, they bring him breakfast, I don't know what, and he comes in and he sees that they're dejected, which they must have been pretty low, because they'd been in prison for a while, and so there's not much more low that you can be, I would think, but they, it was noticeable that they were down, to the point that Joseph asked them, hey, what's going on? And their response is, well, we had these dreams and we don't know what they're about. And Joseph says, uh, in fact, let's turn to this. In, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 39, I want to flip over here. Genesis 39 with the cupbearer and the, and the uh, baker. Here's, what, here's Joseph's, Joseph's response. Thir, four, chapter 40, excuse me, I'm tongue-tied. Genesis 40, verse 8. We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. And here's Joseph's response. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. And here's this guy who has a gift with dreams, and he's still giving credit to God. Right? Here's this situation. He's been, he's been sold into slavery, almost killed by his brothers. He's been lied about, so he's been thrown into prison. Those in, above him have been blessed because of him. And now, he's still giving credit to God for this gift to interpret dreams. So they tell him his dreams, and he tells the, the, the cupbearer, hey, good news, in a few days you're going to get restored 
back to your job. You're going to get your old job back. And he tells him, please, 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 when you get your job back, don't forget about me. Get me out of here. And that's important. I think that's important to note because Joseph wasn't some amazing miracle man that none of this affected. This wasn't a guy who for 10 years had just been going through and, oh yeah, I got sold into slavery and I'm in prison and, and it didn't bother him. He did not like his situation. It was a bad situation to be in and he was human. He felt it. And so just as he told about the dreams, the three days later, the, the baker's head got removed. He got killed and the cupbearer got restored to his position right beside the king. And here's Joseph. He, he begged him before he left, please don't forget about me. Oh, no, no, I won't forget about you. And here's Joseph. Now he's waiting for the, the soldiers to come in, maybe even led by the cupbearer to where he is and, and to lead him out and to set him free. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be wonderful. And he waits and he waits and he waits until he realizes that that no release is coming, that, that he has been forgotten about once again. And so Joseph gets st stuck in jail for two more years, about two more years that he's there. And after about two years, Pharaoh one day uh, has a dream. He wakes up in the morning from a night's sleep and he's had a couple dreams. And he starts asking who can interpret his dreams and no one can. And all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off for this cupbearer. And he speaks up to, the, to Pharaoh and says, you know, I don't know if you remember this a couple years ago when I was in jail. I, I don't really want to, I really don't want to bring that up. Don't worry about it. I'm, I, I'm sure that's water under the bridge. But, but, but when I was there, I want to talk about this guy. And this guy told me what my dream meant. And maybe he can do the same for you. So Pharaoh calls for Joseph, and Joseph gets yanked out of prison, and he gets thrown somewhere where he can bathe, he can get a haircut, he can, he can shave, and he can get a new set of clothes put on, and then he gets brought and set before Pharaoh. And put yourself in this image. Here is Joseph in the best situation that he's been in in years. Everyone is listening to him. Everybody is looking for him for the gift that he has. He's clean. He's fresh shaven. Pharaoh is giving him his attention. And Pharaoh asks him, I hear that you can interpret my dreams. Is that true? And this is Joseph's chance. And, 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 and I want to pause here because these words that Joseph is about to utter are some of the most incredible words you will ever hear. Not, not in the Old Testament, not in the Bible, not in past history, in your lifetime. These are some of the most incredible words that you will ever hear a human utter. Listen to this. Genesis chapter 40, let's see, 41. Verse 16, Pharaoh has asked him, I hear you can interpret my dreams. And this is Joseph's response. I cannot do it. Pin drop. The room is silent. Everybody in the room is probably panicking. The cupbearer is freaking out. Oh no, what have I done? This is Joseph's chance. And he goes on. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give, give Pharaoh the answer he desires. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And, and don't, don't miss this, okay? Here is Joseph. Here's a young man throughout his history. This is his resume. He got almost killed by his brothers, then sold into slavery by his brothers. He lived in slavery, not being blessed, but having his master blessed because of him. He got thrown into prison because of a lie told about the crime that he didn't do, 
Then while in prison, he got uh, the, the warden and the prison got blessed again for him, not him he himself being blessed. He, he was able to foretell dreams, again, giving the credit to God, then got forgotten about for two years. Now he's brought before Pharaoh. This is his chance, and that's how he responds. Not throwing things to the wind and saying, yeah, I've got this gift, I'll do it. Not looking to see what he can gain, but instead, once again, and this comes back, as you see, weaved throughout Joseph's life, every step of the way, it comes back to a measured response. Joseph has been living this whole time. He's about 30 years old now been maybe 15 years that he's been going through this. And in this whole time, he has been living as if God was with him, even when it felt like God wasn't with him. That's a big deal. And Joseph responds, pointing all of the credit once again to God. And so Pharaoh shares his dreams, and Joseph is able to interpret them. And then Joseph, being bold, once again living as if God is with him, even if it doesn't feel like it, gives Pharaoh some advice. Hey, here's some advice. Here's what your dream means. Your dream means you're going to have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of just famine. Just horrible. The worst you've ever seen. And that's where the dream ends. And then Joseph gives Pharaoh some advice. Hey, jo hey, Pharaoh, just a thought. If you want to be wise about this, you should put someone in charge for the next seven years to get as much grain stored up as possible to prepare for the next seven years. And here is how Pharaoh responds to Joseph in verse 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God. Even Pharaoh's having to acknowledge that God exists. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. And Joseph, probably thinking back to Potiphar, is going, yeah, I've heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, I've heard number two in command before. And yet that's what happened. Here comes Joseph now. He's placed number two in command in the entire kingdom. And what Joseph does over the next seven years is he starts building grain storage facilities in all of the major cities in Pharaoh's kingdom. And he starts gathering the grain, buying grain at all of these dirt cheap prices because there's so much. And so it's overwhelmingly in abundance. And he starts buying it up at all of these dirt cheap costs. And then at the end of that seven year period, he starts selling it back to people with a higher price. And in fact, this is going to set up the kingdom of Egypt for generations. This scenario here. And Joseph is, is selling the grain back and, and Pharaoh's kingdom is prospering. Well, as so often happens with famine, not just Pharaoh's kingdom was affected, but the surrounding areas, including the area where Joseph's family was from. And so his father finally sends his brothers to Egypt to buy grain. And here's Joseph. He's about 40 years old at this point. It's been years and years and years. And he's going to be faced with probably his biggest test to this point. And he comes face to face with his brothers. And they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And if you look throughout, I'm not going to go through it right now. I know I'm, I'm already getting along here. But if you look throughout these next few chapters in Genesis, you see this, this back and forth where Joseph is, is somewhat toying with them, somewhat learning about them to see if they've changed who they are, even as he's figuring out how he should respond and, and how he should be treating them. And he's working it through in his mind. It's fascinating. There's an incredible amount of detail here and everything that's going on. And finally, at the end, Joseph, he can take it no longer. He's, he's reached the point where he can't hold it in anymore. And in chapter 5, 
starting in chapter 45 of Genesis, starting in verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence! So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But because his brothers were not able to answer him, but his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. No, duh, right? Here they are. Here's the brother, the second most powerful. Basically, at this point, the second most powerful man in the world at that point. And it's the brother that they sold into slavery years before. And they're going, what, what is he going to do? And he's, he's asking them, what's, what happened? Is dad still alive? What's going on with him? And he's breaking down. And there's this amazing uh, situation here in the next couple of verses where Joseph said, then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. I'm sure that took a few minutes. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And I imagine there, surely there's a little bit of sarcasm there, right? I'm your brother, Joseph. Remember me, the one you sold into slavery? <laughs> As if they could forget. <laughs> And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Catch this. Because it was to save lives that God has sent me ahead of you. And you see the whole reason that Joseph was able to act this way. The whole reason that Joseph was able to make continual measured responses, the way that the reason that Joseph was able to live as if God was with him, even when it felt like he wasn't, was because Joseph understood this principle. He understood that he wasn't God and that God can pull good out of bad situations. Joseph understood that it's, I'm not God. I'm not in control. I'm not the one in charge. My, my goal is to simply live for him wherever I'm at. Because I know that God can bring good out of any of this. And that's what happened. And if you jump to this end of this story, I hope you were able to stick with me without jumping to the end here. Because, because if you were able to stick with me and not remember how it works out... These were responses Joseph was making in the moment over the course of years without knowing that this day would come. And in fact, his brothers were, were not even convinced. They brought his father. His father moved there to Egypt. The whole family moved there. Joseph uh, took care of them, blessed them, protected them. Years later, his father died. Their, their dad passes away, and the brothers again panic. They go, maybe Joseph has been keeping us alive only because our father was still alive. And so they go to Joseph, and once again, they plead for their lives. And here's what Joseph, here's how he responds in Genesis 50, starting in verse 19. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And again, verse 20, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. And if you think about Joseph in this situation, how all of these responses that he gave, they came from a man who didn't know about Jesus, who didn't have a Bible to turn to, who didn't have this same personal relationship with God that we are able to have because of having the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And yet he still continued to make those same choices. To trust God. To live as if God was with him, even when God didn't seem to be there. To, to make measured responses in the midst of situations that would have been easy to simply react quickly. And as we go through this, this sermon series over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at, at some different specific situations that we're going through right now. And we're going to be processing through what does it look like for me to not make a normal response, but to make an unnatural response, a measured response that, that can change 
my life, that can change the direction I'm heading, that can change the world around me because God can do that. God can pull good out of bad. And the thing I want you to be thinking about over the next few weeks is, is how would someone in my situation respond with what I'm facing if they were confident that God was with them? If you were to live and act and respond fully confident that God was with you, how would that cause you to react, to respond, to behave? It makes a huge difference in your life and maybe the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for, for this illustration from Joseph, this reminder of, of how you are with us even when it doesn't feel like it, this reminder of the importance of trusting in you even in the most dark situations, this reminder of your power that can pull great out of horrible. Father, help us to be people that live and respond as if you are with us, to not just reflect, re react and reflect the situation we're in, but rather sometimes, oftentimes, unnaturally, respond in a different way, in a measured way, thinking through how you are leading. In your name I pray, amen.
Good morning. At some point, we're going to have to quit meeting like this, but uh, we will eventually get back face to face. And that's uh, part of what's important about having a communion together, having a meal together, the fellowship meal, or as it was called by the early Christians, the agape or love feast. I am uh, going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 11 with 23 through 34, but I, I'm reading from the message because I'd like us to hear it in fresh language that might perhaps jolt us out of our uh, regularity. And then Paul says, let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the master himself and passed them on to you. The master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, the new covenant, with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back into this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats bread or drinks this cup of the master irreverently is like the part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be a part of? Examine your motives, test your heart, come to this meal in holy awe. If you give no thought, or worse, don't care about the broken body of the master when you eat and drink, you're running the risk of serious consequences. That's why so many of you now are listless, listless and sick, and others have gone to an early grave. If you get this straight now, we won't have to be straightened out later on. Better to be confronted by the master now than to face a fierce confrontation later. You know, as we uh, focus on this passage, there are several words that I think are, are really key that I want to focus on today. The word examine is an important word. There are four or five words in the New Testament that are all translated with the word examine. One means a legal term for preliminary investigation, gathering evidence for a judge in a courtroom setting. Another word means to search or investigate. Another word means to test or approve. Uh, the word used here in 1 Corinthians 10, 28 is to prove or approve. Test oneself. Uh, in other words, the message says, examine your motives. Test your heart. And so when we go looking at the context here, a little earlier we discover that the context has to do, as he talks in uh, verses 17 following, he says, I get this report on your divisiveness competing within and criticizing each other. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. Now, he's not talking about the kind of division that we had introduced in the early part of Corinthians. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. He's talking about socioeconomic divisions within the body. Scripture says that we who have been baptized, immersed into Christ, are all now one. Uh, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither uh, Greek nor Jew. There is neither male nor female, but all are one. Christianity was a truly revolutionary religion uh, as it began, and it still is, for we in the family of God, regardless of color, of social caste, we are one body. We are one family. So what's the problem that Paul is addressing here? When he says, examine ourselves, test our motives, he's saying to us, examine how we are treating each other in the body of Jesus, how we uh, respect each other. What the Corinthians did is the rich 
oftentimes held the worship time in their own homes and, and perhaps didn't join the poorer people who came later and they ate some of the better fruit food and, and, and there's even reports of drunkenness. This was not a fellowship meal of love. It was a time of mistreatment of those who were regarded as less worthy. He also then says he uses the word unworthily. Unfortunately, the, the King James Version used translated that unworthily, and people have taken it to mean if I am worth, unworthy, I can't partake of the bread and the cup. But the word is an adverb. It has to do with the manner in which we are partaking. He says, without discerning the body, that is the church, the family of God. He's not just talking about the broken body of Jesus, he's talking about the church, the people of God. Their behavior toward other brothers and sisters was a repudiation of the gospel itself. Neither slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, rich or poor, but all of us are one in Christ. What therefore, as I examine myself, is my attitude toward the rest of the body? How do I regard all the members of God's family, especially those that we see and worship on a, with on a regular basis? And now though we can't see each other face to face, that will soon pass. And how do we re react with each other? Remember, Scripture talks about taking the person who's seen, seen as a person of es low esteem and treating him with even greater honor. We're to regard with respect every human being made in the image of God and now members of the family of Jesus. Shall we pray? Dear Father, as we come together, and we realize that we're not just coming for a symbolic meal or not just a celebration meal, but a solemn meal, a the meal, the love feast where we declare our oneness in you. Help us to regard each other all with high esteem, as Paul writes, regarding others even better than ourselves. Help us to be in the mind of Christ uh, people who respect one another and lift up to each other. And as we see, this attitude has the ability of changing all the political and social uh, divisions that we have in our country today. Help us to be models of that healing in our own church, in our own families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hi, it's Ben. I just got a couple announcements for you this week. There will be an outdoor service on August 16th at 9.30 a.m. here at the church. We can have 50 people attend. There will be social distance chairs and masks will be required. You must register to attend. There was a link that went out in an email that you can uh, click on and sign up. And we know we've had problems with that. So if you've had problems with that, uh, please call the office or email the office to register for that. So we know that you're going to come. Also, we are doing a free car wash for foster families and DHS workers on August 29th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can sign up on the connection card for a two hour slot or all four hours. We will keep people socially distanced and if for some reason you can't get the connection card to work, contact the church office to sign up for help. And don't forget to fill out that connection card at newportchristian.com slash connect. Thank you guys for everything that you do and have a great week. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you if you are feeling somewhat like Joseph, like maybe God isn't there, like maybe you, no one's looking for you, no one cares about you, uh, that's, that's not true. And I'd, I'd love to be able to offer some comfort to you right now, be able to pray with you right now. If, if you would be uh, interested in reaching out uh, this week, I'd love to, to talk with you. You can call the church at 541-265-2531 or, or email office at newportchristian.com. If you'd like to know what, what it means to, to have Christ as your Lord and Savior, to, to live for Him, I'd love to talk with you about that too. I'd love to, to just touch base with you this week if you'd be interested, if you'd like to reach out. Let's close today with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are with us. Lord, help us to, to live like that, to live as if we are confident that you are with us. Help us to, to trust in you to bring the best out of the bad situation. And Lord, help us to, to make measured responses in the different situations we face. In your name I pray, amen.